Hey, thanks. And thank you all for sharing the next 30 minutes or so with me. I absolutely love sharing my passion for pollinators and wildlife and just nature in general and helping people find their own connections. So yes, I'm really looking forward to talking with you guys today. And butterflies are such amazing insects, which makes this all that much more fun of a topic. Because while we happen to think of butterflies as these pretty little insects that float around and drink out of our flowers, there's so much more to them. I mean, you've got the caterpillars, which look completely different and often go to very different um, plants than the adults do. And not all butterflies even go to flowers. We have butterflies that as adults, will almost never, if ever, go to flowers to drink and to nectar. Instead, they get their nutrients from things like um, the sap off of trees or off of rotting, they'll, they'll get nutrients off of rotting fruit or overripe fruit. And some of them even go to things like feces and scat or carrion, which is just dead things which are very un-butterfly-like behaviors. But with over a hundred different species of butterflies to choose from in Kentucky, we wanted to narrow this down to something that we could actually talk about in five or in 30 minutes or so. So I picked five common butterflies that we're likely to see in our gardens. And since most of us don't, and I really don't recommend ever doing this, putting um, scat or roadkill in our butterfly gardens. We're gonna skip all those. We're going to concentrate on the ones that we all see and enjoy watching on our flowers. And if you want to learn more about some of these other butterflies or go in more depth with some of the ones that we're going to talk about today, I do have a resource page that I created just for this group and this presentation. It will be on the last slide that I show. And it's also, um, I think Kelly's put it in the chat if you wanna click on the link, but don't do that yet. Wait and listen. And that page has profiles of some of these butterflies, some of these other butterflies, um, some of the host plants, just a bunch of different things that I thought, thought you might enjoy. But let's go ahead and dive in here. So, first of all, Really, when we're talking about butterflies and common butterflies that visit our gardens, we've got to talk about the iconic monarch butterfly because this is the butterfly that most of us learn first to identify. And even people who have very little interest in insects and nature and the outdoors in general, a lot of them can identify the monarch butterfly because it is so charismatic and such an iconic symbol. So monarch butterflies, we all know from grade school, they migrate very long distances. And here in Kentucky, we usually see them more in the fall than we do in the spring during migration because the spring migration is very diffuse. So they kind of start off and they go a little bit more and they go a little bit more, but it depends on the weather and they're just kind of spread out more at that point in time. The fall migration tends to be more concentrated and they're coming more at the same time. So we actually see more of them in the fall than we do in the spring. And with the monarchs, we can tell whether they're boys or girls because the males have, I hope you can see the um, cursor here. They have these little black spots on the bottom of that hind wing. And what those black spots are, are scent glands or pheromone glands that really act like butterfly cologne. And it's very specific, it's specific to monarchs. And what that does is the males are releasing this pheromone, this chemical, the, like I said, monarch cologne. And that says, hey, don't I smell good? Come on, come on females, don't you wanna mate with me? And it's that lure to attract the females and get them in. The females, which is what you can see on the top, 
they don't have that. So it's a very simple, easy way to tell whether you have the females or the males around. And as we all know, monarchs, the caterpillars, eat milkweed. That's the only thing that the caterpillars can eat is things in the milkweed family. Here in Kentucky, we have roughly a dozen species of milkweed that are native to the state. The three that you find most commonly in native plant nurseries are going to be butterfly milkweed, common milkweed, and then also um, swamp milkweed or rose milkweed. Now, before everybody freaks out about me saying swamp milkweed, you don't have to grow it in a swamp. In the wild, you find it in wetter places, moister places, than you do say common milkweed, which is one of our other tall pink milkweeds. And so you had, they called it swamp milkweed. What we've found as we've started growing it more in garden settings is that swamp milkweed doesn't have to be really wet. It can grow okay in moist soil or just even medium soil, as long as you water it when we have these big long droughts like we have, which if it's in your garden, that's usually pretty easy to do. So that's when the name rose milkweed started to become more frequently used as a common name. So it can be called either or rose milkweed or swamp milkweed. And I have a bad tendency of calling it both sometimes in the same sentence because I'm a wildlife biologist by training and I learned it as swamp milkweed. Now I'm starting to call it more rose milkweed as I've got my native plant nursery and I'm interacting more with people who are wanting to plant it. Um, but yeah, all three of these are really good for your monarchs. They are also um, really good if you wanna plant them have multiple species. Some, there's been some research coming out of the University of Kentucky a few years ago that really looked at monarchs in garden and way station type situations and what kind of milkweeds they preferred. And that's a whole other topic that I've got some blogs and some podcasts and stuff and my backyard ecology content about that, but we really don't have to have the time to dig in today with it. But very interesting stuff if you want to dig in there and learn more. I do wanna say one thing though. If you're going to the store and buying milkweeds, all three of these are going to be pretty common in all of the native plant nurseries in the state. If you go to a big box store or a traditional nursery, be careful because there's another species that is called tropical milkweed. It's sometimes called Mexican milkweed or Mexican butterfly milkweed. Um, sometimes it's called scarlet butterfly milkweed. This is a tropical species that doesn't grow natively here. And here it's grown as an annual and it's become pretty popular, like I was saying, in the horticulture trade because it's a milkweed that can be grown at commercial levels and sold at commercial levels. Some of these others are harder to do that way. Don't buy it please do not buy that one and plant it for your monarchs. There's some research coming out of the University of Georgia, Athens, which is really showing that outside of its native range, this tropical milkweed isn't that good for our monarch caterpillars. In fact, it can actually cause some issues with them. And again, that's a whole nother deep topic to talk about. But when you're looking for this one, look at, or when you're buying milkweeds, look at the scientific names. And if it's called Asclepius cursivica, that's the scientific name, don't buy it. That's the tropical milkweed. We've got plenty of native milkweeds that the monarch caterpillars here do wonderful on. Get one of those and be safe with it rather than taking the risk of, plant, of potentially causing harm to the caterpillars that you want to promote and help by planting these milkweeds. Now, the other one that we wanna talk about today is the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail. And this one is, prob is, is the second butterfly that I learned to identify. Yes, I learned the monarch in school and stuff, but the, when I first started really getting into butterflies or even before I really got into them, just, oh, pretty butterfly. The Eastern Tiger Swallowtail was one of the ones that I could identify. 
And it is, if not my favorite butterfly, then consistently one of my top favorites. When I have to say favorite butterfly, it's kind of like saying favorite plant. It's what's in front of me now, or what have I been seeing a lot of? Because I've got lots of favorites. But Eastern tiger swallowtails are consistently one of my favorite ones. They're just so bright and pretty and they're big. And I just love the yellow on them too. So bright and pretty. Tiger swallowtails are really cool because you can tell them, again, male from female. All of the males are going to be that yellow color with the tiger stripes on the upper part of their top wing or kind of on the shoulders and the top of their arms. Makes sense where they got their name from, tiger swallowtail. But the females, there's two different morphs. They can either be yellow and black like the male or they can be black. And with telling males from females when the, their females are yellow, you look for the blue along the base of the hind wing. Only females have this blue color here. The males do not. Now, when you go to the black morph of the tiger swallowtail female, if you look really, 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 really close and just the right light, you can see shadows of the tiger stripes still. Sometimes, like I said, you have to be in perfect lighting to see that. But they still have this blue wash here and little whitish, yellowish, kind of thinnish lines along the bottom here. And if they close their wings up, the body is all black, no spots. Tigers don't have spots. That's the best way to remember it. And the reason why we have these black moors is because they are mimicking another butterfly called the pipe fine swallowtail that we sometimes find here. And just like the viceroy and the monarch are mimics of each other, here we have the black morph of the Eastern tiger swallowtail mimicking the pipe fine swallowtail because the pipe fine swallowtail is toxic. But the host plants for the Eastern tiger swallowtails are things in the magnolia family, especially our tulip poplars. They love tulip poplars. Or things that are cherries, especially like our wild black cherry and our choke cherries. And this is really important to remember because we always think of butterflies equal flowers. And for the most part, part, the butterflies that we're mostly going to see in our gardens and stuff are the adult butterflies, our own flowers. Like I said, we're usually not seeing those other butterflies that do unbutterfly like things um, coming to our garden settings. But not all of the caterpillars eat flowers. Many of them host on trees like the eastern tiger swallowtail. And with my nursery and with my consulting business, I've had multiple people come to me over and over again and say things like, I really, really, really want to create a butterfly garden, but we've got these big trees in our community or in our yard, and we just can't see cutting them down to plant flowers. And I say, well, tell me about the trees that you have. And they start listing them off. And oftentimes they have things like the cherries or the, magn or the tulip poplars, things that are host plants. So I tell them, you've already got your pollinator garden. You've got your butterfly garden. It's just that instead of having the adult restaurants, the flowers, you've got the nursery for the kids. And you're still going to have the butterflies coming through, at least the females, because the mamas have to take the eggs and lay the eggs where the babies can eat, which means they're going to be coming through, coming over to the host plants and laying their eggs on those. Also, the next one we want to talk about is the spicebush swallowtail. And this is another mimic of the pipe fine swallowtail. You tell this one apart from the black morph of the tiger, of the, yeah, of the tiger swallowtail because the spicebush swallowtail, it has more blue along the wash of it. And this can be a blue to a bluish green, um, 
differences in male and female, it's not always the easiest to change to tell apart because the differences between green, greenish blue and blue, depending on the individual can sometimes be not as distinct as you would like for it to be, especially when the butterfly is fitting around and going from flower to flower and opening and closing its wings and not really behaving very well for letting you get a really awesome multi minute look at them. Um, so I don't really worry about trying to identify male versus female most of the time. It's just spice versus volatile. But they have that blue wash. And then here, where the spots are along that hind part of the wing right before it goes to the swallowtails, it looks like thumbnails. They look like kind of whitish bluish thumbnails. They're much bigger than the tiger swallowtail, black more for the tiger swallowtail spots there. The other thing that makes it really easy to distinguish the spice bush swallowtail from the tiger swallowtail black morph is that when the spice bush swallowtail closes up its wings and you can see the body, you can see it right down here, it has spots. So that right there says, this is not your tiger swallowtail. Another identifier here is that you've got the two rows of orange spots, but then you've got this swish where it misses the orange spot down there. And so that's another really helpful way to distinguish the spice for swallowtail. And this is another one that doesn't host, the caterpillars don't host, the caterpillars don't eat flowers. Instead, they're on trees, primarily spice bush, and then also sassafras. And both of these are in the Laurelaceae family. And there really are only two native Laurelaceae families here in, or species in the Laurelaceae family here in Kentucky, which makes it really scary too, because here in Kentucky, we now have laurel wilt disease, which is an introduced, which is a disease caused by an introduced fungus, which is transported by an introduced beetle. And it is wiping out first sass sassafras and then going on to spice bush where it has been introduced. And there's multiple counties in the state now that have this. Kind of the epicenter for the state is around Fort Campbell, Christian County area, but it's not spreading out from there. It's, hip, it's hopping from place to place to place because the primary way that it's spread is by wood transport. Um, and that's transporting the fungus, which then gets it all started all over the different places. And I know that, um, the Kentucky Extension Office, UK Extension Offices have done um, various presentations and um, articles and stuff like that on it. I've got a podcast on it. This is something that I really encourage you to learn more about and how to try and prevent it from coming to your area and at least report it when you find it there. Um, it's, it's bad, it's scary because there are so many things that really need these plants. And I mean, like I said, this is the host plant for spice for swallowtails, caterpillars. So we don't know what's going to happen to our spice for swallowtail caterpillars as we lose these plants. Um, yeah, lots of stuff there. And again, that's getting us down rabbit holes that we really don't have time to go into today, but are really interesting. And I really encourage and highly recommend you learning some about. The next one I wanna talk about are the fritterlies. And I'm kind of cheating a little bit with this one because it's not like there's one species of fritterly. We have multiple species of fritterlies here in Kentucky. They are kind of this rusty brownish butterfly that is still a good sized butterfly, but not nearly as big as a monarch. And the browns are very different between the orange of the monarch and that kind of rusty orangey brown of the fritterlies. Um, you'll look at it and go, that's different. That's not a monarch. What is that? And like I said, these are still good sized um, butterflies though. Two of the common ones that we have here are great spangled fritterlies and gulf fritterlies. Um, some of the other species, if I really have a chance to look at them, I can identify them. Most of the time I go fritterly uh, because they're like 
they, they move around a lot too. So it's sometimes hard to get that really good look to study them. But they're really cool butterflies. They're very common butterflies in our gardens a lot of times. The great spangled fritterly, the caterpillars eat violets. So when your garden or when your garden bed, when your yard, when any of those open areas or semi-open areas turn purple in the spring with violets, that's the host plant for the great spangled fritterly caterpillar. And a lot of times there's already caterpillars on it because they'll overwinter either as an egg or as a very, very small first in star, um, smallest caterpillar you can have. And they'll overwinter like that near or on the violet roots. And then once the violets start to come out and leaf out, then the caterpillars become active again and come out of the caterpillar form of hibernation, we'll call it. And then they'll start eating that very fresh vegetation. So violets are amazing plants that often get, don't get the credit that they really deserve. I mean, we could go all into violets because there's so many cool things about them, including a native bee that that's the only thing it, that that's the only pollen that it can feed its young. So yeah, lots of things love violets. Violets are awesome. With the Gulf fritterly, their caterpillars eat passion flower vines and they'll just fall late summer. They'll devour passion flower vines. I love watching them on some of ours, but yeah, very interesting and very common species, especially kind of in the summer, going into early fall, late summer and early and early fall, just wonderful ones to watch. And most of our other fritterlies are hosting either on violets or passion flower vines. So really awesome butterflies here. Then the other one that we want to talk about, and I'm just giving really broad overviews of these just to kind of whet your appetite because, I mean, like I said, we could go so far in depth with these and we don't have time to do that. But today, the other one I wanted to talk about are the sulfurs. And again, this was a little bit of a cheat because we have multiple different species of sulfurs in Kentucky, but they're the yellow. They're the good sized yellow butterflies, much smaller than your tiger swallowtails, no swallowtails, but still very beautiful, very bright yellow butterflies that you see a lot during the summer and into the fall. Two of the common ones are the clouded sulfur and the cloudless sulfur. And with the clouded sulfur, you'll see kind of here along the edge of that upper wing, there's a darker line, and sometimes it kind of smudges out into more of the wing itself. It's cloudy. That's your clouded sulfur. Your cloudless sulfur doesn't have that. It's bright yellow all the way to the edge. And like I said, there's other species, but they're all this pretty yellow color. And they're just, they make me happy. And so that's why I wanted to pull them onto here because they are wonderful um, visitors to our gardens. And they like to host, the caterpillars eat, plants that are in the bean family, the legume family. So we're talking about, and then some of the caterpillars aren't that picky. They'll actually go to some of our non-native clovers, which is great. They'll also go to, of course, our native legumes as well. So things like indigos, our false blue indigos and our white indigos. And all of those, they'll really go to those a lot. Cloudless sulfurs are a little bit pickier. They also go to legumes, but they really, 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 really love specifically partridge pea and sinas. And sinas, this is a senna here in the bottom right-hand corner. And it looks a lot like partridge pea in many ways, except for it's taller and it's bushier. Uh, but it's still got kind of those, those partridge pea-like flowers. But that's what the caterpillars will host on. Cloudless sulfurs are also amazing and really, really cool for another reason. And that is because they migrate. 
not as far as the monarchs do, but they are also one of our migratory species. They go more towards the Gulf Coast and they migrate later than our monarch butterflies do. So the monarchs go through in the fall. And then about the time you're done seeing monarchs is when I start seeing lots and lots of um, cloudless sulfurs going through. And they migrate kind of down here-ish, where we can see them very easily moving through. They migrate much lower in altitude than the monarchs do. But it's just amazing to watch them go through. And even though I see the big migrations kind of a lot of times late September, October-ish, I will often see stray cloudless sulfur butterflies migrating through all the way up to the first really, really hard killing freezes, not frost, freezes. And it'll just be like one or two, but it's really fun to be able to, on those warm November or warm early December days, if it's been a really, really warm fall, look out the window and just randomly see butterfly. I just love it. It just brings a smile. It's like, okay, yeah, we're, we're still got butterflies going. This is cool. And so those are the five main butterflies that I really want to talk about, but I got an extra one. And this one doesn't count against my five common butterflies because skippers are in their own category. Sometimes they get lumped as butterflies and I often do that, but they're not exactly a butterfly. And that's something we've learned as we've done more DNA testing and really dug deeper into what they are. And they're not a moth and they're not a butterfly. They're kind of something else, all of their own in this Lepidoptera family, which is the family of your butterflies and moths. And these are little butterflies, like quarter size thereabouts. And there's a bunch of different skippers there. There's one group within the skippers that I find really, really fascinating. And that's the grass skippers. And those are some of these are some of the ones that you see on the slide here. And like I said, there's multiple different species. These are just a handful of them, but they're all these little quarter sized, roughly butterflies that are kind of this brownish color with brownish, orangish, rustish color with deeper browns scattered throughout. And you can always tell the grass skippers because they have one set of wings that are flat, and then they have the other set of wings that kind of point up when they are resting on the flower and nectaring on the flower. You see these all over the place throughout the year, um, spring, summer, and fall on flowers and gardens and fields and everywhere. And they're very easy to recognize because these grass skippers are the only ones that have these wings that do this. Now, when I first started learning about grass skippers, and what they were, I thought those wings looked like the sail of a sailboat. And so skippers sailing, I thought that was the connection for a very long time. And then I started digging deeper and learning more. And I learned, no, that has nothing to do with it. They're named skippers because apparently whoever named them, when they first saw them, they thought that it looked like these little butterflies, these little skippers, were skipping from one flower to the next and just do, 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 do. Okay, I can kind of see that too. But either way you want to think about it, they are very easy to identify. And at least two grass skippers, um, getting them down to specific species of grass skippers can be much more difficult, but you can at least get it to grass skippers. And one of the other things that are so cool, I think, and so interesting about the grass skippers is that they break the rules in a different way for what's butterfly-like behavior, which of course they're, like I said, they're not exactly butterflies. So I guess we can't really hold them to butterfly-like behaviors completely, but their caterpillars host not on trees, not on flowers, but on our native grasses, like little blue stem and big blue stem and many of our other native bunching grasses. So I know when people are planting, many people like to have ornamental grasses in their gardens. And we never think of putting grasses in a pollinator garden. 
or especially a butterfly garden. But they do have a place. Our native bunch grasses do have a place if you want to include skippers, and especially these grass skippers, into your butterfly garden plantings. And like I said, just for simplicity's sake, I do often count them as butterflies because they fit so well. And they do so many mostly butterfly-like behaviors. But technically, when we dig into the really deep genetics and stuff, they're not. They're kind of, they, they've got characteristics and pieces of butterflies and of moths and just really fascinating of themselves. And with that, I want to make sure that I leave time for a few questions, hopefully. So I want to say thanks again so much for spending the last 20, 30 minutes or so with me. If you want to dig deeper and learn more, I do have this resource page that I created for this program. And you can either type in the link, click on the link that's in the chat. It was way up at the top. Or you can scan the QR code. I try to make it as easy as possible for you to be able to get there. And it's got some of the profiles I've done of some of the butterflies that we've talked about, some other butterflies as well. It's got profiles that I've written about some of our host plants that I've put in there. It also has links to my backyard ecology website where I have a blog that goes into all different things about tips for gardening for pollinators and profiles and spotlights of native plants and different pollinators and wildlife and all kinds of cool, fun, wildlife pollinator nature type stuff for the home backyard or garden area or larger property, just local area. Also, I've got a podcast which digs into some other aspects of it and often has um, guests come on so we can dig into the science and the research and learn more about those things. And then we just launched a YouTube channel. So we're trying to hit all these different areas that, because some people, they really like to read and other people would rather listen and other people would like to watch and just really wanting to help people connect and learn more about nature in any way they can. And I've also got my books that I've written and the habitat, the nursery that I have for native plants and helping people learn how to create really great native habitat for their pollinators, the wildlife, <clears throat> excuse me, whichever it might be. But yeah, I will open it up to questions and answer any that you might have. Thanks again for having me.